Hi there, this is an exciting video as we're almost done with the virtual screen. We actually have a bunch of compounds that computationally uh, bind to the cannabinoid type 2 receptor. So let's talk about that. Last time we left off, we, um, we had set up a job where we docked our ligands to CB1 using XP and kind of uh, stand extra precision using our filtering mode, which we filtered down from uh, 3 million compounds. And I'm kind of proud to present that all the way from 3 million, uh, there are 278 compounds. That seems like a lot. Yeah. We have 278 uh, compounds that computationally uh, fit better inside the orthosteric binding site than uh, the control compounds Win55212. That's exciting. Um, the tough part is, uh, no one's gonna, no one out there is gonna synthesize 278 compounds and try and dock them to try and actually perform, uh, in vitro experiments to prove these actually bind to the cannabinoid type 2 receptor. So ideally what we would do is pick the highest binding ligands. Uh, for example, we can pick like, uh, you know, in a way, there are a lot of papers that show that as the docking score goes up your chances of actually finding a hit compounds, i.e. a compound that actually binds and activates the receptor, uh, dramatically increase as you go higher and higher in docking score. And so what I'd recommend for something like this is probably, probably set the cutoff at negative 11. Let's see how many compounds are negative 11 or better. Negative 11. These are in a way like when you set cutoffs a lot of the time they are they are kind they're not completely arbitrary just guess from nowhere they're arbitrary values guessed with knowledge that you have about the pertaining subject matter and we have 41 compounds that's pretty good 41 is doable even then you'd want to iterate and sort of um, um, filter down even further and there are methods you can use to do that one of them uh, that could be used if I were publishing this in a journal is induced fit ligand docking, which is a docking method that um, looks at the active sites in the um, receptor and considers those as dynamic and able to move. Um, that's a much more computationally expensive method. <sighs> I don't know if I actually want to run IDF on a lot of these. Uh, typically for a large-scale screen, I wouldn't, but if I were narrowing down more and more, I would. For this project, I'm not going to. That will take a lot of time. Well, it'll take a lot of computer time, and I have other kind of projects and priorities going on that I need my computer for. Let's take a look at some of the, let's take a look at some of these higher affinity, higher fitting doc score type ligands. I use the word affinity, but it's really not affinity. It's just how well do they fit three-dimensionally. Um... Okay, let's look at the top one. Negative 12.095. This is our best fitting uh, ligand to the cannabinoid type 2 receptor. Apparently three-dimensionally fitting better than Win. And this compound has a lot of good things going for it from a computational standpoint. It has the, you know, of course, the uh, serine 285 hydrogen bond. It's even got a hydrogen bond with one of the backbone atoms on the leucine 182. It's got a pi interaction with phenylalanine 94. And what's cool is it doesn't have any bad contacts. I am always curious for a lot of these GPCRs, you do want um, aromatic amino acids like tryptophan and phenylalanine to be held in place via hydrophobic interactions. And I kind of want to look at the good contacts here, the hydrophobic. Yeah, so that's good. It pushes, yeah, this is good. This is actually good. It pushes on a lot of these um, aromatic amino acids in the binding site, like tryptophan-194. There's another tryptophan-258 down here. This compound, like, computationally looks pretty good. Um, 
I wouldn't say there's necessarily any red flags about the compound from my standpoint. Synthetically, maybe maybe there'd be some trouble with making this. Uh, there's a stereo center here, as you can see. And sometimes separating enantiomers is difficult unless you have access to like a chiral, uh, chiral chromatography, which is like a chiral column is like 20 grand. Those are really expensive chiral columns. This one has the chiral. I kind of want to see if there's anything that don't have chiral centers. I'm kind of just clicking through. This one doesn't, but I don't know how stable that. This doesn't look like the most stable compound. It's got this weird negative charge resonating on a positive nitrogen. I'm not a, not a huge fan of that. Do we have any that don't have chiral centers? So far, they all do. Kind of want to find just one. This one does not have a chiral center, but the uh, that four-membered ring, uh, ring strain becomes a problem in synthesis. This doesn't have a chiral center. Let's take a look at this one. Let's turn this off. Let's turn this on. Yeah, it's got the uh, it's got the hydrogen bonds that we want, and it's a relatively small molecule. I wouldn't say this is a big molecule. Let's just keep clicking through. If people are interested, uh, these are kind of the final results, and I can kind of uh, I can share these with you if you want. That there's a list. There's. Uh, 41 that I would say are pretty, you know, the better of the bunch. And there's like 250 that all bind better than um, the control win 55212. But some of the, yeah, some of these are, you know, complicated to, to oh, this one has three chiral centers. That's kind of a lot. Uh, well, if you have, because you have two stereo centers, you have diastamers, you have four compounds, it's hard to isolate one of those. That's what I was trying to say. Um, a lot of these have one, which is, that one has two, this one has none, but it's got that cycle pentane. Some of those, like, smaller rings can be tricky to synthesize. I don't know if that's actually, I'm not really an organic person anymore, so I couldn't actually, I shouldn't actually speak to that. I'm not an organic expert by any means. Huh, that kind of, you know what, that's funny, that, uh... That in a way kind of reminds me of it's not it's not it reminds me of like cholesterol but it's not the same structure as cholesterol but it's got eh interesting it's not quite cholesterol or anything but it has those uh, ring like structures um, combined kind of similar to cholesterol no stereo oh, no stereo center no stereo center oh, okay. I'm just kind of clicking through and seeing what looks interesting. There's actually quite a few that have no stereo centers. That would, those would be, be the easier. I mean, I say that without a ton of knowledge of organic synthesis, but I, I'd imagine those would be the easier. And what's nice about a lot of these is they don't really have, they don't have any clashing. Like a lot of these high affinity compounds, there's no clashing between the ligand and the receptor. So that's, that's a good sign. We could turn on intro ligand to see if there's any intro ligand strain this is amazing that's crazy no intro ligand strain no clashing with the receptor i'd say some of these compounds might actually be pretty good that's got some intro ligand strain that does that's that's it i'm impre i'm honestly like impressed with how many of these compounds don't have intro intro ligand strain and also don't have uh overlapping between the ligand and parts of the amino acid residues that's impressed like that's i don't often see that it's usually the case that you have at least like some issues yeah that's amazing okay that's got this has got very mi I mean that I would say that's a very minor issue. You can just perform a relax a relaxation and it should get rid of that strain. But I'm kind of impressed with a lot of these compounds. I'll probably um 
I can upload this list and I'll probably go through all 200 and I'll kind of pick the ones that look good computationally, don't have any clashing, don't have any problems. That's kind of big, that's probably going to have some pro... Man, I'm really impressed with some of these compounds. Whenever I see a good one, I always want to... Ow. It's incredible. Oh, that does have a little bit of overlap right there with the orange. That's okay, though. That one has a little issue. That's, that, I mean, that's very minor, though. Same... And, yeah, basically, as... As a, as a compound gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you're more likely, if the compound gets bigger and bigger and bigger and you keep your binding site the same size, you're more likely to have uh, interligand atomic overlap because the molecule has to fold kind of on itself to fit inside there. That's kind of what I was trying to say there. Man, some of these look, some of these look good. I'm kind of surprised, honestly. I didn't look at these before, so you guys are getting my first impression of these compounds. I was had to make this video because these finished like 20 minutes ago. I was like, oh, I really want to look at these compounds. Okay, that's got minor issues. Yeah, a lot of these look pretty darn good. Like, I'm, I'm very impressed. Wow. I think what we should do, I'll put these compounds out there. What I should do next is to be completely uh, honest, because the sequence homology of CB1 and CB2 is very similar, um, some of these compounds probably are going to be spice compounds. And uh, I'm hesitant to say that as I don't want to, I don't necessarily want to put compounds out there that have potential for heavy intoxication um yeah i mean i back in my early 20s i i did smoke like k2 and those spice compounds like jwh o and a and they are i would not recommend using those compounds they are they're too powerful there's too they're too intoxicating um and not in a good way like i never felt like when I was on K2 or Spice, like it was a good high. I felt like a lot of anxiety and like I'm going to die kind of high, that it was not a pleasant. I definitely didn't have a pleasant experience with uh, those Spice compounds in my early 20s, although I did, I did use them uh, recreationally. Not that maybe like five times. Um, I, <laughs> back, I wouldn't even say back then because I'm only 31, but at that time when I was like 20, it was still kind of hard to buy cannabis. So I was sort of part of that generation of people I'd say where it's like still hard to find cannabis, but then you can get all these compounds in the gray market. And this is, this is like a few years before cannabis became uh, legal in Canada where I currently live. And it was just hard to get uh, cannabis. At the time I was living in Connecticut and it was hard to get cannabis so we would just sometimes buy the you know k2 and these spice compounds through the clear net and you know whew, those compounds were potent i would not i would not personally recommend taking those compounds um but that's just a side story but man yeah a lot of these like i'm impressed like i'm impressed um this is a pretty good drug screen from three Basically, from 3 million compounds, we ended up with about 250. That binds pretty well to CB2. I think in the next uh, video, I'll kind of show you how CB1 and CB2 have similar uh, active sites. And then we'll dock these to CB1 and kind of see what the situation is. Um, computationally, these look really great. In reality, these compounds probably have a decent potential to cause... Uh, intense intoxication so i would not condone using any of these compounds this is cool wow
Ooh, that's a cool one. Ooh, I like that. Oh, that's really nice. I like that that dual pie stack with this uh this ring over here with the Fenno Allen and the uh, tryptophan. That's actually kind of cool. That's nice. All right, I will um. You know, I'm still kind of working through this, and I'm still pretty new at this uh, project idea, but I will try and um, figure out some place where I can leave a PDF of all these compounds. But, you know, this isn't the end. We're going to still kind of um, work on these compounds and figure, figure out which are actually the best candidates if we were to synthesize them versus, like, there's 250. Um... I was really excited to put out this video, so I hope you guys share my excitement in this, and uh, till next time, bye.